Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Sandy, and I am very excited to be giving this talk this afternoon. Um, just give a little bit of an introduction, then we'll jump right into it. So have you ever wondered why American railroads have only experimented with instead of fully embracing electrified railroading? We'll explore some of the factors behind that experimentation, see what has and has not worked uh, in the past and what might work in the future, and discuss how public policy can influence the direction railroading goes from here. This session is about mainline railroads, that is full-size trains, not trolleys, trams, subways, or interurbans. Although, as we'll see, perhaps we should not draw those categories so distinctly. There are a few necessary caveats. This is not intended to be an absolutely authoritative presentation. Um, the divisions and categories that you'll see within it are somewhat arbitrary. I'm trying to tell a story and provide an analysis, not be completely comprehensive. Certainly welcome others' knowledge. I want to emphasize, you know, I work for the uh, Boston uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which does regional transportation planning, but I'm speaking here in a personal capacity. Um, for better or for worse, I've stuffed, stuffed so much uh, material into this presentation, there's not going to be time for Q&A in, at the end. Uh, so I look forward to discussing in the follow-up Slack channel or on Twitter. My uh, Twitter handle is at SandyPSJ. And then at the end, uh, I will share a bibliography of uh, all of the sources that I used to help compile this presentation. So uh, I want to give a shout out to Marco, who presented earlier for asking a really great framing question on Twitter earlier, uh, like last week, uh, that really helps uh, frame how I want to discuss this presentation. Marco asked, I've always thought about railway electrification as a non-reversible and inevitable process. That's how it happened in Italy. So I'm curious to see how and why that was not the case in the US. And that is, in fact, exactly what I'm going to be talking about. I also want to acknowledge Narayan's excellent earlier presentation on the environmental and moral mandate for electrification from earlier today. You can think of this presentation as using historical perspective to answer the follow-up question of, if it's so obvious, why hasn't it happened already? <clears throat> so here we have a chart of selected, this is not totally comprehensive, uh, railroad electrifications in the United States uh, in the period from roughly 1895 to the presence. I really want to uh, give a shout out to Matt Peterson for uh, helping me with this chart. Uh, his Excel skills are far superior to mine. Um, and I just want to point in particular to the burst of activity around electrification from 1900 to 1930. And then how then after that, there's basically nothing for 70 years until right around the year 2000. So there was a lot of really interesting experimentation with electrification early on, both in the US and elsewhere. And through World War I, the US was one of the leading countries in terms of experiments with railroad electrification. One could do a whole presentation just on those early experiments, but I'm gonna hone in on one or two of the most important ones because they kind of set the tone and have also been written about extensively. So the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore uh, was built by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, replaced an on-street connection and a car ferry to create a through route for the B&O from the DC area to the New York City area. Um, and it was, so it was a critical link in their network, but there was a kind of a, a critical flaw. It's about a mile long tunnel and they had steam locomotives pulling trains through it. And those steam locomotives had a tendency to asphyxiate the crews. It was not a very pleasant situation or was not going to be. Um, so they decided to electrify the tunnel and have electric locomotives pull the trains through the tunnel. This was very early. It's the first mainline electrification in the US. So it had kind of an odd setup. Uh, initially, you have an overhead third rail. Uh, you can see on the right hand picture there. But this was eventually replaced by a ground mounted third rail that became standard around the country. Uh, and again, you know, these electric locomotives hauled the steam powered trains through the tunnel. And this would become the standard setup for uh, other tunnel based electrifications. Um, Go ahead. All right, so a pretty obscure and short-lived experiment. The Nantasket Beach Branch of the New Haven Railroad connected what's now the MBTA's Greenbush commuter rail line to Hull, in Massachusetts, which is a popular beach town both then and now. As the picture on the slide shows, the rolling stock on this line was essentially scaled up trolley cars. Uh, they were open to fit with the whole beach in the summer kind of a thing. The electrification experiment was important, not so much on its own, uh, although it was expanded as far as Braintree and the New Haven at one point had a plan to electrify all of its Boston suburban lines. Uh, as for providing the New Haven with confidence to step aggressively into electrification on other lines. After Nantasket Beach, the New Haven did go ahead and electrify several branches, 
in central Connecticut for trolley service. Uh, they gave up on third rail powers because it had a nasty tendency to electrocute cows and occasionally people. So one thing you see among early American railroad electrifications is that they often happen for a highly specific purpose, really following the pattern set by the Howard Street Tunnel. So this made operational sense, indeed was often necessary for implementing particular infrastructure improvements. It also meant that these operations were isolated rather than integrated into the broader network. And that operational disjoint is what we'll see would eventually end most of these operations once technology meant they were no longer necessary. We have two very similar operations to talk about here, the Norfolk and Western and the Virginia. And these are essentially similar routes, uh, railroads set up to haul coal from beyond the Blue Ridge down to Tidewater at Hampton Roads. And both of them electrified a portion of their route. Uh, in both cases, the part with the toughest grades. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, very similar. They, they Norfolk and Western was built and abandoned a little bit earlier. Norfolk and Western ended up uh, controlling the Virginian, but this association between coal hauling and steep grades and electrification is something that pops up again and again. There's an interesting footnote to that history. In fact, uh, according to a 1980 U US DOT report, the Burlington Northern considered electrifying its coal hauling territory from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming to Lincoln, Nebraska, which is a line that's completely different geographically. It's basically completely flat, but exists for largely the same purpose that these two lines did. So this is kind of odd cultural memory going on of uh, the idea that you should call, haul coal but with electric power. So one of the lesser known electrified railroads was a short segment through the Hoosac Tunnel in northwestern Massachusetts. It took around 25 years to build and uh, had to be bailed out by the state. The construction killed around 200 workers. Um, the tunnel is almost five miles long, so that's much longer than the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore. And you can imagine if, if the Howard Street Tunnel had smoke problems, you can imagine what it looked like in the Hoosac Tunnel. I just want to you know, call attention to this really cool graphic that I found on the state website uh, showing the uh, length of the tunnel there under Hoosac Mountain. So the solution then was a short electrification, really just from portal to portal. Uh, this was one of the earliest abandoned uh, electrifications in the US as soon as diesels became available in 1946. Um, and like the Howard Street Tunnel, steam trains would be pulled through the tunnel by electric locomotives. There's a similar situation on the other side of the country, uh, the Cascade Tunnel for the Great Northern. I uh, actually started two years earlier than the Hoosac Tunnel in 1909. Uh, but unlike the Hoosac Tunnel electrification, this one eventually grew to be much longer. Uh, it grew from an initial just through the tunnel to a total of 73 miles uh, from Wenatchee to Sky Commission, Washington State. Uh, and it was eventually abandoned in the post-war period uh, when they were able to convert to diesel locomotives from steam. But in fact, ventilation does remain a problem in the Cascade Tunnel today that limits capacity because it has to be vented after most trains. All right, two other similar small uh, operations, hauling trains between Canada and Michigan under the water border, uh, the Grand Trunk St. Clair Tunnel and the Michigan Central Detroit River Tunnels, uh, very similar to the mountainous tunnel operations just underwater instead of under a mountain or city streets. Uh, sorry, all right. So in most cases, Railroad electrification in the US was a choice of private companies. But in a few circumstances, including the two I'm going to highlight here, it was actually kind of forced as a matter of public policy. Uh, like the tunnel related electrifications that we just talked about, both of these were directly related to the limitations of steam locomotive technology, namely the smoke that they created. Uh, but here the danger was to the public rather than to the train crews. So of course, famously, Grand Central Terminal in New York City uh, still operating today. A major crash in 1905 uh, got New York City to have the state pass a law mandating electrification in Manhattan or really banning steam locomotives, um, which is still operative today. Uh, this And then electrification happened very quickly. Uh, but it was in operation by the end of 1906 um, on the, what are now the Hudson and Harlem lines operated by Metro North. Lesser known and shorter lived electrification of Cleveland Union Terminal, um, which was operative from 1930 to 1953. This was a major development project um, really facilitated by the Van Swearingen brothers who controlled the Nickel Plate Railroad and what are now two of the light rail lines in Cleveland. Um, smoke abatement and, and converting to electric power was uh, required by the city to a large extent 
Um, and in fact, this, this is kind of indicative of many early American electrification projects um, that it became an operational and a physical problem. It didn't make sense operationally. Uh, it was a union terminal, but not all the railroads in Cleveland used it. Sorry, I have to get rid of my cat. Um, and uh, some of them had to go out of their way to reach the terminal and therefore never used it. Uh, and having to attach an electric locomotive was an operational problem as well. So there's this great essay that I found in researching this presentation uh, that really asks the key question, at the same time as electric technology was maturing in Europe, right after World War I, why did it stall out in the US? Um, and he goes through a uh, series of, of talking points. You know, there's a high initial capital outlay. Uh, it's very expensive upfront. And at the time, especially, there was no such thing as an off-the-shelf electrification installation. There was still actively active contention over what was the best technology, DC versus AC, um, and a large association with uh, GE and Westinghouse going at it in terms of who was going to be the main provider of electric technology. Uh, the shock of World War I, when the federal government took over the railroads and uh, really ran them into the ground in terms of infrastructure, uh, which was then 10 years later, followed by the Great Depression, which meant the railroads were spending their capital funds uh, fixing the networks, essentially, rather than uh, expanding. And there was an uncertainty around industry consolidation, Bunch of railroads were thinking about merging and they didn't want to make capital investments while that was happening. Management was very conservative. This is still true today. It always comes up in our discussions of American railroading. Uh, people just wanted to keep doing the same thing they, they'd always been doing uh, and weren't really interested in electric trains, even though they really did have big advantages over steam locomotives. Some of the utility companies didn't want to provide power to the railroads. Nobody really seems to be sure exactly what that was about. It doesn't make a whole lot of ac economic sense. Um, but it does seem to have been a thing. The federal government was very hands-off, uh, despite having taken over the, the railroads in World War I. Uh, they maybe kind of went a little bit in the, in, far in the other direction and didn't want to help facilitate electrification. And then finally, after World War II, you end up with the railroads being dieselized, and uh, the advantages of diesels over steam mean that the advantages of uh, electrification over steam are much lessened. And uh, you know, to this list, I would just add, given the, the tunnels and, and uh, station situations that we just talked about. Um, there are significant operational considerations around electrifications in many circumstances. Um, for, you know, if we think about the uh, Swiss planning principle of organization before electronics, before concrete, um, you might argue that some of the ways that American railroads handled uh, electrification on the early side from that perspective were bad, um, that they were not thinking about operations first. Uh, that they did what was necessary to get some trains through the tunnel, but they never integrated the electrification into a broader network. And so you're adding complexity rather than detracting from it. All right, so predictably, the railroads got rid of these special purpose electrifications as soon as they could. <clears throat> Dieselization began in the uh, 1940s in earnest, and you can kind of see uh, across the decades from 1946 through the early 60s, all of these special purpose electrifications are abandoned. We can talk a little bit about some more uh, established mainline electrifications that are still around, some of which are still around today, that were less of a special purpose kind of a deal. So I already talked about how the New Haven was an early experimenter with electrification. Now let's talk a little bit about the outcome of that experimentation. They're incredibly successful electrification of the main line between New York City and New Haven with AC catenary operations starting in 1907. The slide shows a diagram of the electrical system as it existed back in the day. Though mostly known for passenger trains, both commuter and intercity, on what is today Metro North's New Haven line, uh, the New Haven also ran electric freight. On the slide, we have pictures of two of the New Haven's most notable locomotive types. On the right, the EP5 and the famous McGinnis paint scheme. These were known for being high performers with a regrettable tendency to catch fire. On the left, uh, those locomotives might look familiar. Uh, they are, in fact, the same locomotives from the earlier slide about the Virginian, or at least the same type. Uh, known as ELCs on the Virginian EF4 on the New Haven, uh, they would eventually wear two more paint schemes after this, both Penn Central and Conrail. So you're seeing how the very few electrified railroads are really, swiping rolling, are really swapping rolling stock and selling it to one another because the market is so small. So the most notable electrification in the US and the one most intensively used today, although parts have been abandoned, was that of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which happened gradually from the first decade of the 20th century through the 1930s. 
The electrified network mainly encompassed what we now call the Northeast Corridor between DC and New York, uh, but also extended west to Harrisburg and onto Long Island through the subsidiary uh, LIRR. A couple of lines that have now been de-electrified along the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania and branches in New Jersey were mainly used by freight. Uh, electric freight was ended by Conrail in 1981. So the PRR electrification, like that of New Haven, carried both suburban and intercity trains. We'll talk about the Philadelphia and New York suburban networks in a bit. But for now, here are probably the, the PRR's two most notable types of electric rolling stock, the long-lived GG1 locomotive. And yeah, that's a Lionel model of one on the mantle behind me, uh, and the MP454 suburban EMU. So longer than the PRR electrification, much less intensively used and much less successful was the US's only other major mainline electrification on the Milwaukee Road in Montana, Idaho, and Washington State. It was electrified for many of the same reasons as say the Virginian and Norfolk and Western, that is to say grades and tunnels. But the Milwaukee Road at least made an attempt to create a longer operational segment to reduce operating inefficiencies. Unfortunately, they failed. Um, as you can see uh, in the map on the slide here, uh, they managed to electrify two separate segments and not close the gap in the middle. Um, and the picture on the right in the slide, which shows a little Joe electric hauling a train with diesel power, uh, kind of demonstrates the inherent inefficiencies of this operating pattern uh, and that outcome. In addition to which, it was lightly built, uh, inadequate with inadequate power from the beginning, and uh, the Catenary was supported with uh, really kind of interurban style trolley poles, very lightly built wood poles that were really falling apart by the 60s. Um, and the infrastructure was in poor shape. The electrification was abandoned in 1974. And within 10 years, the entire Milwaukee Road Pacific extension had been abandoned. Uh, it's a real tragedy because it happened right as the federal government was interested in getting involved because of the energy crisis and funding might have come through to modernize the system and connect those disconnected segments. So one place where electrification has found a home until very recently is on a few remote railroads designed and intended basically only to facilitate mining. Several of these don't even connect to the national network. And all of these kind of owe a tip of the hat to the upper left corner there, the Butte, Anaconda, and Pacific in Montana. Um, yeah, and most of these have now been abandoned, uh, several of them just in the last couple of years. Can't do a presentation on electric railroading in the US without mentioning this now unique operation, the Iowa Traction in Mason City, Iowa. Uh, like many electric lines, it has an heritage of being an interurban hauling passengers as well. Um, some of the locomotives are over a century old. Uh, it does continue to hang on as an independent short line. It's the last electric freight operation in the country, certainly that I'm aware of, but I believe it is the only one. So most Americans who are familiar with electric railroading, of course, are familiar with it from suburban or commuter operations. While instructive in their own way, I've left them to here because I think that from the perspective of national policy, they're actually less interesting. But we can't not talk about it. So we have here a handy table from a recent paper showing a wide variety of factors behind suburban electrification. So it's not enough time to go through it all, but I am happy to share later. I want to thank Shawl Picker for making this map inspired by a Rethink NYC document allows me to cover the entire New York City area in one slide rather than many. I think one thing jumps out, and that's really this doesn't feel like a unified network. There's several different power standards. The network feels very fragmented. It's a consequence of this being constructed by several different private railroads at several different, several different times. And now much of the network is controlled by, uh, you know, theoretically through the MTA, but the MTA can't get its two railroads to cooperate on anything. Worth noting that the uh, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western network in New Jersey, uh, which is some of the green that you see on the map, was converted from DC power to AC in the 1980s, was modernized by New Jersey Transit. Moving a little bit south from New York City, Philadelphia's suburban network is, with the exception of the New Jersey Transit Atlantic City line, entirely electrified, uh, the consequence of a choice by SEPTA to abandon its diesel operated extensions in the 1980s now melded together through the center city tunnel that was built in the 80s. Half of the lines are of PRR heritage and the other half are Redding. Kind of famously, and as the map really makes clear, SEPTA's infrastructure is nearly of the quality that you'd see in a European S-Bahn system, but has never been operated that way. Uh, instead, they've stuck to the American commuter rail model, which is mainly serving peak commutes for white collar commuters. The Illinois Central and uh, now Metro Electric Division could have otherwise fit under smoke abatement because it was kind of done in agreement with the city of, of Chicago. Uh, 
to help reduce smoke on the waterfront. It's one line with several branches, including the independent South Shore, uh, which we'll cover next. It did, it's interesting because it ran as true rapid transit. It's got all high level platforms and ran as uh, extremely frequent service, really every 10 or 20 minutes up until the Metro era, which started, you know, Metro took over full operational responsibility in, in the early 80s. It's the only electric line in the Chicago area, although there were interurbans. Um, and again, we see the pattern that these electrifications were not ever made into part of a network or never expanded into a coherent network. And of course, we can't talk about Metro Electric with talking about the South Shore, uh, which is functionally in many ways a branch of the Metro Electric, electric District. By heritage and interurban, uh, and we have uh, pictures on the slide of street running in uh, Michigan City, Indiana, which is still going on, although they are working on a capital project to take the trains out of the street. Um, and then kind of very rural interurban character further east of Michigan City going out to South Bend. Um, and this shows the blending of the categories that we somewhat take for granted. This started as, a, as an interurban, as a trolley line, um, and now it's being run effectively as a, an FRA regulated conventional commuter rail line. Um, and that has had some interesting operational implications. But I think we can remember that, that 80 years ago, these distinctions were not as written into law as we consider them now. Little known, but worth mentioning, the Boston Revere Beach and Lynn. It was abandoned a long time ago in 1940. Uh, but some of you have probably ridden the route. Much of it is now carrying the MBTA Blue Line Rapid Transit. Uh, steam, it was powered by steam for most of its existence, but converted to electric power by turning their existing coaches into EMUs in the late 1920s. Uh, unfortunately, then the Great Depression hit and it was abandoned in 1940. It did have one fatal flaw, um, which was that it had no direct access to downtown Boston. Uh, people had to take a ferry across the harbor from East Boston. This was also a narrow gauge railroad. So we've already discussed why electrification didn't spread much in the US after its initial burst around the time of World War I. But now that we've talked about some of the operations that did survive, why did electrification never take off in any time since then, including during the energy crisis of the 1970s when it was intensively studied? The reasons given in various sources sound fairly, simili fairly similar to the reasons given for the post-World War I period. Diesel push-pull reduced benefits of EMUs relative to steam once you could put a locomotive on one end and a cab car on the other, uh, which you couldn't do with a steam locomotive, then uh, the, op the operations at the terminal end of a line become much easier. Um, there's a mismatch between the high capital cost and the long lead time for implementation um, and these fluctuations in energy prices that sometimes provide a motivation for electrification. Um, the existing electrification infrastructure in many places, such as the uh, Milwaukee Road and Pennsylvania's freight installation had really deteriorated by the 70s and was not in good shape and needed to be uh, fully revamped, which would have been basically nearly as expensive as uh, installing a new electrification freshly. Um, the railroads wanted to maintain a unified fleet. You hear this over and over again. Uh, you know, we only want to maintain one kind of locomotive. They only wanted to maintain diesel locomotives, even though uh, electric locomotives are actually much easier to maintain and last much longer. Um, and finally, and this is the one that comes up over and over again, if you read through the sources on this, um, a lack of federal leadership. This is something that, um, you know, the railroad industry is run predominantly privately in the U.S., even the public agencies sometimes have problems cooperating with each other. And uh, there was a real need if there was gonna be a coherent network and electrification program for the federal government to step in and do something about it. And that never happened. Um, the transition into the Reagan era effectively killed the great deal of interest that had existed in electrification in the seventies, even if it made both economic and policy sense, which it did, um, it was something that required federal leadership and coordination. And of course, the Reaganites were ideologically opposed to the concept of doing that. So to finish on a more positive note, let's talk about a few more recent developments. Uh, in 2000, Amtrak finished electrification of the Northeast Corridor, extending it from uh, New Haven to Boston and initiating a cell high speed service at the same time. This is something that the New Haven Railroad had studied repeatedly and never got around to. Uh, it's not a true high-speed line, more of an adaptation of the existing infrastructure, but uh, you know, we'll take it. Uh, 
several, uh, so Denver, I think, is one of the really positive examples. They've opened several electrified commuter rail lines just in the last four years since the A-Line opened in 2016. The rolling stock is a piggyback on SEPTA's Silverliner 5 order. It's integrated into the RTD light rail system. As I understand it, the selection of the commuter rail mode was made mainly because uh, BNSF and UP refused to continue sharing right-of-way with light, smaller light rail trains. But it operates at high frequency every 15 to 30 minutes and with full fare integration and small crews. Um, it really shows that you can run mainline trains as a rapid transit system, part of a rapid transit system, which is a con concept that's been lacking uh, in the US as several other presentations today have uh, made clear. Caltrain, of course, is in the process of electrifying their line um, as also related to the uh, California high-speed rail uh, program. They're using Stadler Kiss EMU's off the shelf European product. Very exciting. The timeline they give here, which I took from their website, may be somewhat optimistic, but we'll see. Um, and then we're seeing a little bit of a 70s-esque resurgence of interest in alternative power. The ugly duckling on the left on the slide is a Wabtec or formerly MD battery loco that is testing with BNSF. It's not true electrification, it's more like the battery in a hybrid car as it runs in a contest with diesel locomotives. Uh, on the right is Alstom's hydrogen powered train that is tested in Germany and Austria. The tech is clean, but not so energy efficient at this point and appears suited mainly to branch line operations. It also doesn't perform like a true electric train and more like a DMU. Um, and then it's well known that, uh, it's, or it's been reported recently that both major Canadian railroads, CP, CP and CN, are showing a significant interest in alternative fuel technologies. So that's something to monitor. Getting to the end here. So a few uh, kind of critical questions that I wanna leave folks with. Um, are air quality and global warming the new smoke abatement? Is this a public policy issue that government can do something about to force electric, railroad electrification? Uh, in Southern California, the South Bay Air Quality uh, Management District has been working with the railroads on air quality. They haven't been super duper aggressive thus far, but, um, and, and the Staggers Act in 1980 removed a lot of the ability of local authorities to regulate railroads, but it's something to look into. There's a need for legal research and uh, certainly an interesting field to explore. Can the feds lead? Um, you know, our American, in, in the US, our road pricing policies and freight policies really favor trucking. And we know that railroads are the cleaner and greener method, even with diesel power, but all the more so with electric power. Um, but there's virtually no chance that the Amer the freight railroads are going to want to invest in electrification without federal leadership on this issue and helping them and helping shift mode share from road and therefore revenue from road to rail. Do non-federal jurisdictions have any leverage to help lead on this issue? Can conservative conservative railroad culture, which we've heard has been a problem since World War I, uh, change or be forced to change? And can we avoid silver bullet and gadget bond fetishism? The idea that you know we can't just follow international best practices and install a standard electrification, but do fancy things like hydrogen trains and uh, new technologies that we hope will save us. So why this yellowed picture to finish off the presentation? I think it's full of symbolism. What we're seeing is an electric train on the Butte, Anaconda and Pacific, a road built for one highly specific heavy haul purpose crossing over the Milwaukee Road and also the non-electrified Northern Pacific. Per an article in Trans Magazine, this picture was staged by General Electric, which built both railroads electric locomotives. So what we're seeing is kind of representation and promotion of private industry all the way down. There's nothing coordinated other than in very specific circumstances. Today, the Butte, Anaconda and Pacific still exists, but it's dieselized. The Milwaukee Road, of course, is gone. And the old Northern Pacific Maine is out of service just a bit east of here at Homestake Pass. There's a, an interesting quote uh, from a uh, 1980 US DOT report. It says, financing a national program of electrification in the US at a cost of at least several billion dollars is as stated previously, simply beyond the means of the railroad industry. If it is to be done, it will require government assistance. The railroad's financial position has improved considerably since then but the fundamental reality is probably the same. Pushing electrification in the US will require a concerted intentional effort, the likes of which has never been attempted before. I see we are at time, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
and hand it over to the next presenter. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to discuss in the follow-up Slack channel.